Uh, this session, we're going to be more specific. We're going to look more specifically at radical Islam, and I want to acknowledge that uh, I have some sources here. If you change to the next slide. Uh, I became really interested in world religions years ago when I audited a class in uh, world religions. Uh, Dr. James Chancellor, who uh, recently retired, uh, he was at the Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, and he was working on his doctorate in, uh, at the time I met him, he was uh, uh, working on his uh, dissertation uh, through Duke University, and he had spent some time talking, uh, living in, in uh, Egypt, uh, becoming acquainted with kind of an obscure cleric, and and uh, he wanted to contrast political ad attitudes between an obscure Egyptian cleric and an obscure American evangelical preacher. And so he looked up obscure preachers in the Yellow Pages. I was listed there. And uh, he uh, recruited me then to be the person he interviewed for his dissertation. And uh, he was teaching a class on world religions at a nearby college. And he said, in exchange... Uh, you can uh, audit the course, and I'll pick you up every week, take you to class. We can talk, go out for coffee afterwards. Well, to me, this was wonderful. I'd go to class, hear his lecture, then we'd go to coffee, and I would ask him lots of questions, and it really whetted my appetite for world religions. I kept his classroom notes, and so some of uh, what I'm going to be presenting comes from those notes, which, uh, and I mention it because, uh, not only because I don't want to plagiarize, but also look at the date. 1986, and uh, the Iranian Revolution was still fresh in everyone's memory. Uh, his notes really predicted a lot of things that have come to pass. The other source, I've been asked for a good book. Uh, Dinesh D'Souza's 19, uh, 2007 book, The Enemy at Home, is a really good book explaining why they hate us. Uh, everyone hated this book. Uh, conservatives hated the book because it disagreed with their theory. And liberals hated the book because it disagreed with theirs. And the subtitle of this book is it has to do with uh, liberal culture and how it has uh, created, at least exacerbated our problems with the Islamic world. But I, I, when I saw a book that's hated by everyone, I thought it might be worth reading. And uh, I was right. And the advantage is Dinesh D'Souza was raised in India. And so he has the perspective of someone who actually grew up in a, uh, a majority world culture. And so he's looking at the things through that lens. So he's not look, he is a political conservative in this country, of course. Uh, but he's not looking at the thing from the lens of a, a political conservative. As a matter of fact, he, he says, you guys got it wrong. And he's not looking at it from, certainly, the lens of an American liberal. Uh, rather, he's looking at it the way someone from the developing world or the majority world is going to look at us. And uh, this book, I can get it, uh, I looked, and you can get it for a penny at Amazon uh, Marketplace. It didn't sell a lot. I think it's one of the best books D'Souza read, especially if you want to know specifically why they hate us. And so it's very readable, and I would recommend it. To begin to understand radical Islam, you have to understand the collision between Islam and the modern world. The 16th century, the 1500s, uh, marks the beginning of what is called the modern world. The key date, just a little bit before that, was 1492, at uh, the very end of the 15th century. Uh, this was the dawn of the modern era. And if you had looked at the world at that time, the number one military power in the world was Islamic. Uh, the Ottoman Empire was the most powerful military uh, force. It was the world's superpower, and it controlled the trade routes uh, to the rest of the world. Part of the reason for the age of exploration was to try to find an alternate route 
uh, to China, to the uh, East Indies, so that you could cut the Ottoman Empire out of things. Uh, in addition to the Ottomans, there were two other great Islamic powers. You might think, well, at least Europe was number two. No, it wasn't. Uh, the Iranians, the Shiite Empire, uh, was an Islamic empire that was second in power only to the Ottoman Turks. And if you went uh, further east, you would have come into another great Islamic empire, uh, the Mughal Empire in India. And they controlled all of the Indus Valley, Pakistan, northern India. Uh, the most powerful most sophisticated, most advanced civilizations on the planet were all Islamic. Now, Europe was a backwater. Uh, so that's the way it would have been at the dawn of the modern age. Uh, in the Islamic world, there was a flowering of Islamic culture. There was a golden age. Uh, for example, in Iran, uh, in the uh, Shiite Empire, some of the most beautiful poetry that the world has ever known was being produced during this time. But within 200 years, everything changed. An event known as the Great Western Transmutation occurred, and for reasons that are still debated among historians, the West suddenly took off. And uh, nothing like it has ever happened before in the history of the world. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Until this point in time, uh, progress, growth, technology had been extremely slow, and if we had charted it, the growth line would have been extremely gradual. Uh, you could have fallen asleep a hundred years before. And when you woke up, there would not have been much of an adjustment. Uh, not much would have changed. Very few new inventions would have been brought online. Uh, so human progress, if you want to look at it in terms of knowledge and uh, technology and so forth, was very slow. And everything was proceeding about the same rate. And then all of a sudden, the West took off. Vroom. Nothing like it in history. And here's kind of the chart. You see the, the rest of the world with a blue line there. And that's kind of the way human progress was going. And you notice that the West is below that because the West was not doing as well as other places. The Islamic world, it was a little better. You go to China, it's a little better. If you would have predicted at the beginning of the modern age that some civilization was going to take off and have this enormous uh, growth, you would not have predicted Europe. You would not have predicted the West. You might have predicted China, because China was really advancing fairly quickly, and it looked like they were poised to, to become expansive, and all of a sudden they retreated in on themselves, and nothing happened. And if you had guessed, if you were a political observer, and said some civilization here is going to take off in 200 years from now, it's going to be in a position to dominate the world. Uh, you would have guessed it would have been one of the three Islamic civilizations. Uh, the West was divided. When Rome fell, it broke apart into various factions. Uh, the West was not much of a factor. And then 1492 happens, and you can see the growth curve after that. Uh, the Islamic world was among the first to feel the winds of change. Things were beginning to change when the Muslims were driven out of Spain. The last Muslim stronghold in Granada uh, fell in, guess what year? 1492. And so the Muslims, uh, until then they had been expansive. They had been expanding. Or at least they were holding their own. And then there was the Reconquesta, as step by step the Spanish drove uh, the Muslims out of the Iberian Peninsula. By the way, Muslims still believe it's theirs as part of the House of Islam. If it's ever part of the House of Islam, it's always part of the House of Islam. 
Uh, but what this meant was the Spanish became some of the most fierce fighters in the world. Uh, you see then what they did in the conquest of the New World and the way in which uh, they went about that. Uh, so the, the Islamic world was the first, among the first, to begin to feel as the West began to flex its muscles and began to move out of what is really the Dark Age, the Middle Ages. Now, a question we want to consider is why did it happen? And historians, as I mentioned, are divided. One question, one uh, explanation, it was just blind luck. As uh, they were looking for a, a way around the Muslim powers that controlled the trade route, they found the Americans and they discovered gold. And all of a sudden, there was this dramatic increase of wealth throughout Europe. And it threw the rest of the world into inflation. Well, that happened. Um, but, uh, and some historians say that's what it was. But most historians say, well, not enough. Capitalism is often uh, cited because capitalism produces wealth. And uh, the introduction of capitalism into the European democracies is often credited uh, Capitalism spurred technological innovation. And capitalism, wealth, and the means of production then shifted from the land. The Muslims controlled a lot of land. They did a lot of farming on that land. Uh, but within 200 years, uh, wealth had uh, shifted. It was in the banks. It was in commerce. It was in uh, newly emerging industries. Uh, Capitalism changed the world, and many feel that it left the world behind then. The U European nations had capitalism. The Muslim world did not. Uh, it went against some of their most cherished ideas and values, and so the West left the rest in their dust. Uh, nationalism uh, grew up during this time. Uh, you saw the emergence of the nation-state. People began to find their identity in uh, the nation they were a part of, the language group they were a part of. Um, the West, for whatever reason, found itself, and the nations in the West began to find themselves uh, in a position because of the growth of technology, military might, wealth. Uh, they found themselves in a position to redefine the world. And they did it. And the world has never seen anything like it before. Innovation, uh, change, progress became the norm in Europe, where the other uh, places in the world continued to maintain and defend the way it had always been. Uh, Europe was changing, and change was embraced. Uh, a second important question we want to consider is how did all this impact the Islamic world then? as they begin to find themselves eating the West's dust. Well, one of the things that uh, was a problem was the very concept of law. We talked about this briefly. In the West, something new emerged, democracy. And human beings began to see themselves as the source of law. And the laws they wrote were flexible. They were constantly changing uh, to adapt to the needs of the time. In the Islamic world, law comes from God. You don't change the law of God. God's law is perfect. Well, as the West became increasingly able to impose its will on the rest of the world through colonization, democracies and legislatures began to be forced upon the Muslim world. Let's take countries in sub-Saharan Africa that were Muslim. Uh, they were colonized by the French, the British, the Germans, the Belgians. And uh, suddenly they found parliaments there and uh, democracy and, and Western liberal values, uh, liberal with the, uh, not in the modern sense of the term, uh, and, and these things were foreign to them and offensive to them from a theological standpoint. Uh, and they, they, uh, uh, to them, it looks like godlessness. Uh, you in the West, you're Christians. You have 
the book. You have the Ten Commandments. Why should you not just be finding out ways to better implement the law you already have? Why are you writing new laws? Uh, why are you creating laws? You're not God. Uh, so the West was culturally and theologically offensive. Uh, as the West triumphed, uh, Christian civilization, as it had come to be seen, Christendom, uh, was imposed on the world through colonization. And this was resulting in a crisis of faith in the Islamic world. The crisis of faith is, according to Islamic teaching, what is history supposed to look like? Who is supposed to take off and subdue the rest of the world? Islam. Who took off? Christendom. So, the exact opposite of what was supposed to happen, happened. Christian civilization had triumphed over the rest. And Christian civilization was forcing its values upon the rest of the world. And the rest of the world was increasingly powerless uh, from stopping it from happening. Uh, Britain destroyed the Mughals. Uh, Iran was isolated, and then it was Persia. Uh, the last bastion of Islamic uh, influence and power was the Ottoman Empire, which was becoming called the sick man of Europe because it was in visible decline, and everywhere the Muslim looked, the West was what Islam was supposed to be. And this resulted in a, a, an enormous crisis of faith. Uh, Islam had always believed that it was destined to be what the West had become. Big event. Catastrophic event. There was still a caliphate with someone considered to be an appropriate uh, leader of the Ummah existed in Sunni Turkey and the areas controlled by the Turks. Uh, the Turks lost the First World War. The Ottoman Empire fell. Uh, the caliphate was abolished by the man who became the leader of Turkey, a general who directed the Turkish forces at Gallipoli, where so many Australians and Englishmen lost their lives, became the leader of, of Turkey. His name was Otto Turk. He's greatly celebrated in the West. One of the first things he did was to abolish the caliphate. He was determined that if Turkey was going to be able to be a viable power in the New World, it had to modernize, it had to westernize. And he drug Turkey quickie, uh, kicking and screaming into the modern world. Uh, but for devout Muslims, this was a hard pill to swallow. The West had won. The Ottoman Empire was broken apart. You still had Turkey uh, controlling uh, Turkey, what is today Turkey. But the rest of the Ottoman Empire was now divided among the victorious allies of the First World War. Uh, you had, uh, you know, British sections. Uh, you had uh, French sections. Uh, America made a deal with the House of Saud uh, for oil and became then the protector of the House of Saud. And, uh, you know, just the world, uh, everything got messed up. 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, 500 years at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, the war ended in 1918. Uh, the Islamic world, the house of Islam has been conquered. In Turkey, the center of the last caliphate, Islam has been renounced and they've embraced Western standards. They have a parliament. They have all the trappings of a European civilization. 
Uh, you can imagine why something like that would be a hard pill to swallow and why it would shake your faith. Uh, nation states, when they finally gained their liberty, guess what the West did? The West decided this is going to be the, le- the way it's going to be. We're going to draw a map, and this is going to be Iraq, and this is going to be Syria, and this is going to be Lebanon. Uh, the map of the Middle East was drawn uh, primarily by the Brits. And sometimes you say, it, it, it's insane. Uh, the boundaries of these new states are so poorly drawn. They, they include traditional enemies, and they're supposed to be con- uh, you know, cohesive uh, political entities. Parliaments were forced upon these things. Uh, the Brits were not crazy. They figure as long as they're fighting among themselves, we won't have to worry about a caliphate anymore. And uh, so there was a method to the Brits' madness. It was madness. And so here's it about Muslim, and now they have a parliament. Now they have lawmakers. It seems like everything the West is doing is slapping at their face. And uh, a crisis of faith and producing an underlying anger. The worst moment was when the West, after the Second World War, established a Jewish state on Muslim land. Uh, This was at the very least a pan-Arabic tragedy, but the Islamic world is nothing if, uh, united on nothing if it is not united in its hatred for the Jews. And here the victorious West once again imposes its will on the region and plants a Jewish state. To this date, the date of Israel's founding, which is May 15, 1948, uh, this date is referred to as Yom on Nakba, or just Nakba, the day of the tragedy. Third question we want to consider is uh, how the West's cultural norms have been popped impacted the Islamic world. Okay, the West is in control. They've, uh, they've exerted political power. They've actually occupied uh, the house of Islam with armies. Uh, they have imposed their will. But worse than that, they brought their stinking, decadent culture with them. This is what's brought out uh, so well in Dinesh D'Souza's book. The Islamic world certainly hates what we've done politically. They hate what we're doing politically now. Uh, But what really makes them mad is that we are threatening to destroy their culture with our popular culture. We're corrupting their kids. They see the West as the great Satan, as Satan, the United States as the great Satan, because they see most of this cultural rot is coming from the United States of America. And our kids are being tempted. In Islam, Satan is a seducer. That's why they call America the great Satan. We are the great seducer. And through the seduction of our decadent culture, We are destroying the moral fiber of their own culture. And frankly, they don't want their kids to grow up to be like American kids. This is why I say you're going to find you have some common ground. And this through the movies? They know us through our popular culture, through television, movies, uh, music, sports. As the West uh, grew in power and in wealth, as we know, it became increasingly secular. And with this came the rejection of traditional morality in favor of a new, secular, more liberal morality. And I'm going to begin to quote liberally from Dinesh D'Souza's book because uh, I, I, I would just have you read it all and then come back and talk about it, but we don't have time this afternoon. So I'm going to put before you certain excerpts from the book that I think will help you understand. It says, liberal 
morality emerged in resistance to traditional morality that holds sway in all traditional cultures and that consisted uh, of virtual moral consensus in America prior to the 1960s. Traditional morality is based on the notion that there is a moral order in the universe which established an enduring standard of right and wrong. All major religions of the world agree on the existence of this moral order. You may not know that, but there is really not much religious diversity when it comes to questions of right and wrong among the world's traditional religions. So there's also a surprising degree of unanimity about the content of the moral order. There's also widespread acceptance in traditional culture that human behavior falls short of the universal moral code. The existence, even the persuasiveness or pervasiveness of violation was never considered an argument against the moral code. On the contrary, it is precisely because of the imperfection of human nature and the depravity of human conduct that an unwavering moral standard was considered indispensable to provide a guiding light for human aspiration and to bring forth the better angels of our nature. Do you understand what he's saying? I know my reading wasn't top of the line. Uh, everyone agreed. The world, when it came to moral matters, was a traditional religious world when it came to matters of morality. Uh, the Muslims would have come to 19th century America and they would have at least been at home, morally speaking. As the West embraced secularism, though it increasingly rejected traditional morality, a transformation that to this day the Islamic world views with disgust and alarm. Maybe you share that. Ken from D'Souza, the radical Muslims are convinced that America and Europe have become sick. Demented societies that destroy religious belief, undermine traditional morality, dissolve the patriarchal family and corrupt the innocence of children. The term that radicals use to describe the Western influence is Farangi. The term means Frankish. Do the Franks, the Crusaders. Uh, and it refers to the Frankish disease, syphilis, a disease that Europeans first introduced to the Middle East uh, during the Crusades. Today, Muslims use the term in a metaphorical sense to describe the social and moral corruption produced by the virus of westernization. The Muslims who hate us uh, the most are the ones who have encountered Western decadence, either in the West, as they've come here to study, or in their own countries. This is really hugely important. Who hates us the most? Those who know us the best. What is it that they hate about us? Our decadent culture. Our immorality. They've seen it. In many cases, they've experienced it. And this is the Frankish disease. This is, as the Crusaders introduced syphilis to the Middle East, so the modern Crusaders, and they call us Crusaders, have introduced the virus of westernization. It's the new syphilis. It's a moral syphilis uh, that destroys innocence, that turns people into atheists, that, that corrupts everything. See what I mean? That you may have something in common with them? Uh, this is from some uh, uh, some graffiti uh, that was found uh, it's been found all over Iraq right after Iraq fell. Uh, people wrote this on the walls: "Marriage of the same sex became legal in America. It hadn't yet. It this it should be it's this with the mafia and drugs. What you no excuse me it should be is this with the mafia and drugs what you want to bring to Iraq." America? Is this the freedom you promised? Good question, huh? Uh, the graffiti began to appear after the fall of Baghdad in 2003. Uh, interestingly, 
a decade before same-sex marriage became legal in the United States, but they saw the handwriting on the wall, and so they wrote it on their walls. You know who Amman al-Zawahiri is? He's the head of al-Qaeda. He was uh, the right hand of Osama bin Laden. And he said this, The freedom we want is not the freedom to use women as a commodity to gain clients when deals or attract tourists. It's not the freedom of AIDS and an industry of obscenities and homosexual marriages. It's not the freedom of Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib. You know, what was offensive about uh, Abu Ghraib to the Arabs? The female soldier with the... It was pornography. Here was out and out, these men were being sexually tortured, and a woman was pictured being in charge of them. They said, this is American girls for you. This is America. We don't want that. If that's freedom... You guys think your freedom is so great? We look at your freedom, what do we see? We see women used as commodities. Uh, we see AIDS. We don't want that freedom. We see industries devoted to the production of obscenities. We have a push in your countries for homosexuality. You sicken us. You disgust us. We don't want that. Uh, this would be... Uh, Something you can understand why uh, or uh, Dinesh D'Souza's book was hated by liberals, uh, because what he says is this is really what it's about. It's about culture. Again, from D'Souza, isn't it true as many Americans believe that American culture is broadly appealing around the world? Yes, and this is precisely why America, America is the main target of Islamic radicals. Decadence is arguably worse in Europe than America. The Islamic radicals focus on America because they recognize that it is the leader of Western civilization, or, as they sometimes put it, the greatest power of the unbelievers. Uh, it's, just, it's just kind of an interesting thing here. Now, someone might protest, well, I know that when they went in to uh, kill Osama bin Laden, they found that he had all these pornographic movies that he was watching, you know, he had a collection of the thing. Uh, they will also say, what about the, the guy, the, the guy that they took out in Yemen, the American clergyman, he was picked up for prostitution here in the United States. And they think somehow they're scoring some big point by saying uh, something that would make sense to Americans, that these guys are hypocrites. Why don't these guys lose their credibility in the Islamic world? Well, this is a culture that blames women for seduction, right? <laughs> And so who is responsible? The idea is who, would, who could be blamed for not being able to resist the seduction of American? Who can be blamed for being a, not being able to resist pornography? It's not that there's some moral flaw in Osama bin Laden. This is just proof that American decadent culture has the ability to seduce even the best of men. Who can blame him? You can see this in India, by the way, uh, Hindu culture. Uh, when I went there this last summer to teach, a uh, pastor came up and talked to me and said he had had a considerable problem in his village because it, he let it be known and it got around that he was going to go meet with uh, a group of Christians and they were going to take training. And uh, the rumor around the village was he was going to go to uh, Delhi and be involved in orgies with Christian women. And the reason for this, they had seen American movies and they had seen some gal in a movie go to bed with someone with her clothes off and everything with a cross around her neck. Now, Americans watching that might have not even noticed a cross. They did. To them, this is a Christian woman. This is what Christian women are like. See, she has a cross around her neck. Um, the... Most of the world finds us offensive while they find us attractive. Uh, isn't it true many Americans believe that uh, American culture is broadly appealing? Yes, it is. And they look and say, 
the thoughtful people and the leaders of those countries, and particularly the religious leaders of that country, says, this isn't good. And in the Islamic world, they say, this is what we want to be. We're going to have gay marriages. We're going to have AIDS. We're going to have all these academic epidemics. Our kids are going to be disrespectful to their parents. Uh, we're going to have a feminist revolution in our country. We don't want this crap. Whoops. Talked like I did at school. <laughs> uh, that's exactly what they say. Only they, don't, they say it in Arabic. <laughs> As opposed to French, like me. Uh, another quote by uh, Dinesh uh, D'Souza. There is a growing belief in traditional cultures, a belief encouraged, but by no means created by Islamic fundamentalism, that America is materially pro uh, prosperous but culturally decadent. It is technologically sophisticated but morally depraved. As former Pakistani Prime Minister Benazar Bhutto put it, Within the Muslim world, there is a reaction against the sexual overtones that come across in America, ma American mass culture. America is viewed uh, through this prism as an immoral society. What angers religious Muslims is not American the American Constitution, but the scandalous sexual mores they see in American movies and television. What disgusts them is not free elections, but the sights of hundreds of homosexuals kissing one another and taking marriage vows. In other cultures, China, Nigeria, India, there are similar concerns that American culture and values are destroying the moral basis of these traditional societies. This resistance is summed up in a slogan often used by Singapore's former Prime Minister, Lee Kuan Yew, modernization that should be without westernization. I just ruined his statement. They're interested in technology? Sure, they want to modernize things. They want indoor plumbing. But they don't want to become us. What this means is that traditional cultures want prosperity and technology but they don't want to be like America. Is this kind of helping you see where they're coming from? This would be radicals and non-radicals. Uh, there is a general consensus in the developing world that America is depraved and we have cultural imperialism going on as they're forcing their depravity on the rest of us. Uh, fundamentalist Muslims then portray America as nominally Christian, but de facto an atheist society. Although people in America call themselves Christians, their actions prove that they are indifferent to God and that their real religion is materialism. Have they nailed us pretty, pretty well? They begin to think that maybe they're right about America? Maybe not in their tactics, but at least their diagnosis of us, not too far off the mark, is it? Well, let's move on. This guy's important. Uh, Saeed Khatib, he is probably the most influential Islamist thinker of the 20th century. Uh, he spent time in America. He went to school here. He visited churches in the U.S. before he returned to his native Egypt in 1950s. Uh, he would eventually die because of his Islamic radical activities. Uh, and he observed that even when Christians go to church, it's usually just for social display to meet members of the opposite sex. Well, he didn't visit churches like ours, did he? Well, yes, he did. He says Protestant preachers are mainly entertainers who put on all kinds of cir circus antics to attract listeners and then measure success by how many people come marching down the aisle. This was in the 1950s. By the way, J.I. Tozer was writing much about the, much the same thing. He could see it coming and could see where it would lead to a culture in which anything you do to get a crowd becomes acceptable. 
That's a shame, isn't it? Here's a guy that heard the gospel. But what he saw with his eyes was more powerful, a more powerful message than what he heard with his ears. And he went home and became the intellectual father of the modern radical Islamic movement. Qutib was especially revolted by the fact that American religion has been driven out of public life and has nothing to do with the institutions of government, separation church and state idea. So that the de facto, boy, I'm leaving out a bunch of stuff. I should proof these better. The de facto atheism of the people is reinforced by the de jure atheism of the laws as a consequence of the American doctrine of separation of church and state. Quatrib writes, God's existence is not denied, but his domain is restricted to the heavens and his rule on earth is suspended. Quatib, uh, Quatab was also appalled by the most tragic result of America's sexual ethics, the breakdown of the American family. He wrote, if free sex, sexual relationships, and illegitimate children become the basis of society, if the relationship between man and woman is based on lust, passion, and impulse, and the division of work is not based on family responsibility and natural gifts, and if the woman is freed from her basic responsibility of bringing up children, and if on her own and under social demand she prefers to spend her ability working for material productivity rather than training of human beings, because material production is considered more important, moral value, and more honorable than the development of human character, then such a civilization cannot be considered civilized, no matter how much progress they make in industry and science. Interesting perspective, huh? See, you might say maybe the difference between his point of views and ours is we live in it, and he says we need to destroy it and replace it with Sharia. Is this helping you understand the mindset? Not saying I want you to prove the mindset. This is understanding radical Islam, and I want you to understand where they're coming from. Khatib argues that America is rep represents a new form of jah uh, jahiliya, uh, which means bar barbarism, the same kind of barbarism and immorality that the prophet Muhammad encountered in Arabia in the 17th century. In Kitab's view, the new barbarism is worse because at least the Bedouins were ignorant. By contrast, the new barbarism is far worse because it's based on knowledge. It represents aggression against God's governance of the earth. I uh, should be in this view. The United States has willfully rejected Christianity and chosen to celebrate a pagan culture and a depraved system of morality. Katub concludes that it is one thing for America to degrade itself. It's quite another for America to use its wealth and power to impose ruin on the rest of the world. Pretty strong stuff, huh? What do you think? Got one more presentation and then we'll call it quits. Anyone have any questions? Thoughts? Randy. Why did I have so many typos? Is that the question? <laughs> no, nothing like that. Um, I'm going to go back from before the, the break at noon uh, with the first question. That is, what dictates when a piece of land becomes the house of Islam? When it's conquered. Whenever it's conquered and forced to submit, the people on that piece of land forced to submit to Islam, it forever then becomes part of the house of Islam. All right, thank you. And the next question is, uh, at the time of World War I, um, at the end of the, of the caliphate, uh, mm -hmm. Would, would the Islamics or Islamic State say that they were all under one human? Uh, 
probably uh, the Sunni of the world would have looked to the caliphate as their spiritual home, even if they were not under its geographic control, because the caliphate that was set up was legitimate. And uh, about a, we can't go into completely, but a devout mon uh, Muslim would have some responsibility toward and respect for that caliphate. Uh, this would not have been tri true of the Shiites, because the caliphate waits for the arrival of the rightful caliph, the 12th imam. And so though they would have an Islamic state, or what they call themselves today, an Islamic republic, they have not declared a caliphate. Which uh, most people would not understand, why don't they do that? They have control land, they rule land, why haven't they declared a caliphate? Uh, it has to do with their eschatology. Explain that just a little bit. The ex eschatology. Their eschatology would be the view of the end times. In the last days, the, the Mahdi, which they believe will be the 12th Imam, will reappear. Uh, there's different kinds of Shiites. There's uh, Seveners, Fivers, and Twelvers. The present government of Iran is Twelver. And they believe that there were 12 uh, lawful descendants, uh, uh, caliphs, of the prophet. The 12th of these uh, disappeared. <coughs> they believe he is still here, but not in a physical presence. And that in the last days, he is going to reappear. And so they would be waiting for the reappearance of the 12th imam and uh, the rightful caliph. Uh, both uh, Shiites and Sunnis believe in the coming of the Mahdi. The Shiites believe specifically he's going to be the 12th Imam. <coughs> Anyone else? Pastor Mark, the, I, I don't understand how this works, but the whole thing is, is don't they train like little kids to fight? So they don't understand all of this. Is it just their devotion? Well, uh, it is it's a doctrine that, you know, we learn Jesus loves the little children and they learn other things. Right. And so but this is something they are raised in. It, it's just their devotion to their family, their teachings. Even though they Actually, I can show you on the Internet sermons being preached by little kids in which they are... Uh, declaring jihad, the destruction of the Jews, and so forth. Uh, pretty chilling stuff. So you think they understand more of it than what? Well, they understand what they were raised with, the same as we understand what we were raised with. And it isn't all Muslims, again, that are teaching this. We're talking, remember, about the radical, and uh, they're teaching their children to view the world the way they view the world. Although I would say there's a general disgust at the United States throughout the Islamic world. Not all of them are ready to wage violent jihad to bring us down. But everyone is concerned, how do we protect our families from this cultural imperialism of the United States? So why do they let their kids come over here for education? Uh, well, they're to bring it back, and they want modernization. And but aren't they a well, and that, that happens. They realize the West is seductive, but quite often they return home having seen the West and say, it's just as disgusting as we thought it was. You ought to go to the college I visited and see the morals on that college campus, they would say. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, you mentioned eschatology. The Christian eschatology involves the valley of uh, Megiddo and, mm -hmm. and uh, Armageddon. Mm-hmm. The Muslim eschatology is here being my question is this uh, the Sunni or Shia or both involves the beat and north of the the, the uh, similar uh, playing out of the events to the, the events in Armageddon. It, it, yeah, it, it, the fascinating thing about Islamic and uh, Christian eschatology is they do intersect, and I have a, I have a a. a uh, Overlay, or not overlay, a slide I show on this. I don't have it in this slide set because we're not going into eschatology. But it, their false prophet and 
Mahdi look exactly like, or their prophet, Jesus, and Mahdi look pretty much like the Christian false prophet and antichrist. And the story is kind of the same except uh, the antichrist, which would be Jesus, is overcome by the Mahdi and the real Jesus. And so they have an antichrist in their theology and everything. It's, uh, it, it is fascinating to look at the similarities. There are some good books on this subject, too. Any other questions? I want to get you home by kickoff. <laughs>